is Sabu with Hannibal TV. I'm gonna do a career interview. This is Hannibal here from thehannibaltv.com and I am with WWE and ECW legend slash WCW superstar for a short period of time. Sabu. How are you doing today? Pretty good. <laughs> what are your uh, first memories of wrestling? Uh, first memories of wrestling, uh, well, I was probably, I don't know, three years old or younger, and I uh, was watching my uncle on TV. And was he your favorite? Oh, yeah, of course. He was attacked a lot. Uh, he's probably the most attacked heel of all time. Did he ever tell you any stories about some of those attacks? Yeah, but he also said, you know, that mind my own business, not to, you know, live his life, you know, don't try to copy him. Was there any favorite match of the Sheiks you had growing up watching? Well, the favorite, uh, one of the favorite opponents was uh, Bobo Brazil. Uh, that was, he was one of the famous ones, favorite ones. Did you ever meet him? Oh yeah, many times. What was he like? Super nice guy, giant, like six foot nine. Giant, super deep voice, nice guy. What was the Sheik like uh, outside the ring as your uncle? He, he was mean and he was the Sheik outside the ring too, but he was also my uncle. You know, he had, he had some compassion, but not, not all, like he was a rough, hard to, hard to, rough to be around. Did you ever see him wrestle in person? Oh yeah. Now, you were shot when you were young. How did you survive getting shot in the face? Yeah, uh, I guess by luck. Uh, I got shot and hit, it hit my teeth, and when I hit my teeth, it shattered and, and uh, didn't kill me. I guess you had to get full uh, teeth replacement. Yeah, well, on one side. And part of my face is a little still paralyzed now. I, I can't, like, part of my mouth is still down. Did the guy get away with it? Uh, yes and no. He got nine months in the county jail, but then later on, uh, he got killed by doing another some uh, robbery or something. Was he, was he involved in gangs? No. There was no gangs around where I lived, just uh, cliques, I guess, you know. And you have a book out that uh, I actually read before doing this interview, and you mentioned in that book that you actually were a bit of a thief when you were young, and sometimes the sheik would actually give you talking to after you were caught. I guess your mom would take you over for him yeah. to... Yeah. Well, I never took it serious because when, I, when they caught me, they, they barely slapped me on the wrist and I'd get a couple months probation and uh, I'd just go back out and steal again, you know, get caught and steal again. I got caught six times in uh, one weekend and they uh, kept letting me go. It was hard to stop stealing. <laughs> there was no penalty. But anyways, when the Sheik found out there was a penalty and one day uh, I, was on, I was on my way to go to the, the mall to go stealing with this ja uh, gym bag, this cop pulls up to me and goes, are you Terry? And I go, yeah, he goes, get in the car, get in the car. And my mother called the police on me to pick me up because she knew I was going to a steal. My uncle told my mother to call the police on me, so she did. And uh, that straightened me out. I went to jail for a few days, for four days, and uh, I never stole again. And you were an amateur wrestler, which some people might find that surprising. A amateur thief, too. I yeah. quit. <laughs> <laughs> I quit. Uh, you, you had some success in amateur wrestling, didn't you? No, no, not really. It, it was too constricting. I wasn't much of a collegiate wrestler. I, I was a good student, but I was a terrible uh, following the rules wrestler. And uh, I went outside the guidelines, outside the rules too much. Not the rules, but the guidelines too much to where uh, it was just uh, frustrating. So I was only using amateur wrestling to prepare me for pro wrestling. And I knew that from day one. I knew that before day one. That's exactly what I did as well. Uh, so you actually eventually ended up being trained by the Sheik, but it was a long process. What finally made him agree to train you after uh, wanting to be a wrestler for so uh, long? Uh, uh, I got, when I was 19, I got shot. And then uh, a couple of days out of the hospital, I gave him a call and said I wanted to be a wrestler. He said, of course. So when, after I got shot, that kind of kicked us both into gear and to start uh, taking actions towards that. Because I was like saying, I'm going to be, but never really... Uh, Never uh, did it without actually really doing it. And now it's pretty easy to get trained as a pro wrestling was easy. It's different. For your actual training to be a pro wrestler, from what I understand, you really had to pay your dues just to learn the basics. He made you set up and take down the ring, do all kinds of crazy stuff. Yeah. Um, can you just tell us some of the stuff he made you do before he actually started teaching you how to wrestle? Well, first you drive through the town five, six hours. You set the ring up. Uh, sometimes by myself, uh, 
sit the people down, referee the first match, uh, no, wrestle the first match, referee the, the next five matches, tear the ring down, and head to the next town. And that would be one night, so that was, and uh, you know, little to almost no pay, but you didn't expect to, to get paid with money, you got paid with uh, knowledge. And who were you wrestling for mainly when you first started, just independent? Well, my uncle's uh, uh, big time wrestling when it was right before it completely, right before it completely fizzled out. It was nothing then, but still, it was something for me to learn. And uh, other Midwest uh, ter territory guys. Did your uncle ever give you any insight into why he thought it fizzled out after having such huge success? Was it WWE taking over? Yeah, well, it was uh, Vince buying up, all, buying up all the talent, offering the guys more money than he could afford to pay them, and any more money than anybody could afford to pay them. Did At you the have time more money than they were worth? But not, not that, you know that changed. Did you ever meet Lanny Poffo when he was wrestling for? Shoot? Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, his dad and brother are good friends of my uncle. Yeah. And uh, I guess Al Snow, we wrestled for him as well. Oh yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. One of the first places I worked was for Al Snow, second or third match. And you also worked uh, for the Bear Man up in Canada, I think. Yep. How was he to work for? It was great at the time. I didn't appreciate it, but now I look at it, it was great because uh, we had to wrestle every night in front of like a thousand people, and uh, get paid for it. And uh, later on, we'd wrestle in front of nobody and not get paid, or wrestle a thousand people and not get paid also. But uh, I didn't know how good it was in the beginning to get, get to get paid. Kevin Sullivan said he actually got paid a lot by him. Was he a good payoff guy? Yeah, but it's not for the young guys. <laughs> <laughs> and you told a story uh, in your book. You don't have to go into as much detail here, obviously. His book's available online. I'll put the link in the description of this. but. You said there was some controversy over Adrian Adonis's death when he was on a tour with yeah. the Bear Man. Yeah, they were doing a tour of Newfoundland, and uh, uh, Dave McKinney and uh, one of the Kelly twins, and Adrian Adonis, two of the Kelly twins, and Adrian Adonis, they drove off a cliff drunk, and the ring truck was behind them, and they followed them, and they followed them down the cliff, like 100 feet down the cliff, and found them in the, in the water, and they, they, it looks like they took their wallets and stuff and then called for help. And then in the meantime, a couple of them died. One of them drowned when he could have got help, you know. Because you were saying Adrian had his Japan payoff with him. Well, he, he had a, a ring. He had a big ring and uh, his wife was missing it. And they asked him where the, that's how they figured out the ring was missing. I mean, that that stuff was missing. He didn't have his ring with him, which he always had his ring with him. And the wild man had all the gate money yeah, for the, the bear money. man. But that was cash, there's no way you could prove that. Uh, you worked for the USWA up in Memphis. Was that, you were booked by the Sheik, I guess, to work yeah, up there? Yeah, that was the first place I worked outside the independence where I was Sabu. Right before that, I was Terry SR. And uh, I don't know what the SR stood for, but leading up from day one to five years later, uh, being Terry SR meant Terry nobody. It didn't matter who I was, no one's gonna remember that anyways. So when I, after five years of wrestling, of being Terry SR, my uncle named me Sabu the Elephant Boy. And, and uh, about six months later, I went to Memphis. Terry SR, you were saying, stands for Terry Sheik's Revenge? No, I don't know. It could be. I, 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 have to, you know, I say that sometimes, but I don't know. He never told me. Uh, anybody who asked him, he always, told them, he always told them to mind their own business. He told me once to mind my own business, I never asked him again. I didn't care. Because he, he goes, it means uh, uh, nobody cares who you are right now. Nobody cares, you know. So those days didn't exist back then. Now there's internet and video, videotapes. And before, there was a rarity that we got videotaped, you know. And Sabu, the Elephant Boy, was a story from a movie, I guess? Yeah, The Jungle Book. He always wanted to be the actor in The Jungle Book, this Mobley, this guy in the, the Jungle Book, and he was called Sabu, the Elephant Boy. And Elephant Boy actually means like a cowboy. You, he herds elephants, it's supposed to be like a, a big deal job in, that, in India, but no one, else, no one else understood that. So when he wasn't looking, I'd drop the Elephant Boy and just left Sabu, then everybody else would drop the elephant boy. No one else got it. You know, only one who got it was a sheik, and, and I barely got it. But anyways, uh, then uh, this came Sabu. You know, how was working for Jerry Jarrett? Uh, it was all right. Uh, I, I can't say he was fair, but he was sort of fair. You know, he, he didn't promise nothing. He gave nothing, and actually, he promised nothing and gave less. Did but you ever? He was all right, I guess. Well, I can't say that much. Did you ever wrestle Jeff Jarrett up there? Yeah, a few times. Uh, when I first got there, I did, and I wrestled him a few times, maybe 10 times. How was he? He was a good, good guy to work with. Not a good guy to work for. <laughs> did you have much contact with Bill Dundee? 
Uh, very little. What about Jerry Lawler? A little. You know, none of those guys that had time to talk to us. The only time we talked to them was if we wrestled them. Right, because they were the stars, I guess. Mm. Uh, was Robert Fuller up there at that time? Yeah, Tennessee stud. Yes, he was. He, he, re he tagged with Jeff Jarrett at the time. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I interviewed him. He seems like a nice guy. Was he yeah. all right? He's a great guy. What was your favorite match? You know match? why they call him Tennessee stud? No. To go dick. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you saw that in the dressing room. Yeah, I couldn't help it. How was well, the... I've seen that the hotel room. <laughs> was, uh, I know you were never really into this type of stuff, but uh, was the groupie scene still around in the Memphis territory oh, yeah. at that yeah, time? Yeah, that was part of the payoff. If you didn't have a, a rat, then uh, you're getting out some pay there. You know, you, you'd like losing pay if you didn't have a rat. It was just a, that, something about that. Well, you needed the rat to survive, like cook for you and clean for you and like run back and forth to a real house with money and come back and not pay you, but take care of you. And I we guess... You make enough money wrestling. We made sometimes $15 a day wrestling. Sometimes, usually nothing. A $15, I thought, we got paid $15, that check usually bounced. I didn't have a good $15 check yet. Wow. But, you know, if they give you a couple hundred, that might, that might pass. But a $15, $25 check, it's not even worth writing the check. But it, then when you, it's not even worth cashing it because it would bounce, you know. What was the average crowd back then in that territory? Uh, a good house was 100, 100 people. And for 100 people, I'd, I'd make $150. Wow. And that was like top pay of any, that's because I bitched, you know. I couldn't bitch for everybody. But I bitched, so they, they paid me a tiny bit more. And pretty soon after that, I guess you had your first chance to go over to Japan. Yeah, yeah. That was uh, the Sheik hooking you up? Yes. And it was FMW? Yep. What was uh, FMW like in those days for those who don't know what that company was uh, all about? It was, uh, you know, blood and guts. But uh, how it first happened was they were having this uh, tag team tournament. Onita, uh, Mr. Onita was having this tag team tournament and he called the Sheik and he says, you can come over and be in this tag team tournament. It's you and anybody. He goes, well, I'll bring my nephew. And he goes, bring anybody. We don't care. So they brung me and then uh, I happened to get over more than they expected, so then they, they kept me. But first I had to start just filling a, a spot for Sheik, just to highlight Sheik. What was the culture like over there? Uh, it was cool. I, what do you mean? Uh, like, cool. the difference you know, between here and, and there, I guess. Like. Uh, they worship Americans more than we worship Americans. <laughs> oh, really? They're cool. And you had some experience with uh, sponsors because you were over there with the Sheik? Yeah, it's a lot of mafia sponsors, and yeah. They, they, yeah. I guess he was a legend over there. Did you, did you notice when you were over there with him, he was treated even oh, more yeah. differently? Than yeah. Uh, even now, they, I mean, if he's alive now, they still treat him differently than they treat anybody now. You know, they, they, uh, they treat him like he was a, you know, a, a movie star, not, not like a, a funny athlete. Did he ever tell you who he liked working the most? Mm, yeah. Oh, yeah. He liked like the guy I was talking about earlier, Bobo Brazil. Okay. And how did you start doing the barbed wire matches, which you've become famous for? I guess it started over in FMW. Yeah. Uh, one day I happened to have a barbed wire match. It was an a, a, a eight-man tag barbed wire match out of the blue. I didn't know why I was having it, so I did it. And uh, I tried really hard at it, or really tried my best at it, which meant I didn't think I'd see another one for 20 years. But I didn't know t two weeks later uh, I had another one, I had two of them. And then a couple weeks later, I had a couple more. And then, like, finally, you know, about six months later, I had like 16 barbed wire matches, 15 barbed wire with 15 barbed wire matches in 16 days. You know, and uh, and they thought I liked it because I go, why am I in all these barbed wire matches? He goes, you love it. I said, no, I don't. And they said, well, you act like you do. I said, well, it's called being a professional. You don't love anything, but you do it because you're good at it, and that you give it your honest effort. But uh, they took that wrong. But anyways, it ended up being a blessing in disguise, sort of. Did they have medics backstage in those days? No, they, they did on big shows, but they were scared to come over to our side. They, they only treated the Japanese. They didn't treat our side. Really? Yeah. I read one story in your book. I guess Chris Candido helped seal you up after a particularly <laughs> That was my first barbed wire match, yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. And you wrestled after basically sealing yourself up with super glue. Super glue and tape, and every night they'd break open. And then by the end of the tour, uh, my hands got infected and stuff, but it wasn't because of the super glue. Everybody misconstrued that. The super glue is clean. It's, it's oil based, uh, not oil based. It's <laughs> alcohol based, and so it's clean. And it was called uh, surgical glue before it was called super glue or crazy glue. 
Now, Kevin told me this story about the ring catching on fire. You also talk about it in your book. Um, I guess Sheik almost died. Well, sort of. Yeah, the ring didn't catch on fire. It was a fire match. And the yeah. ring was set on fire. And uh, uh, it got too hot. And then so I, I jumped out first, and the Japanese jumped out, and then Sheik jumped out. But Sheik doesn't jump out. He had to crawl out slower than we did. So he got burned by the flames. Uh, close to his back, like he wasn't engulfed in the flame, but he got he got too close to the flame. And it was sucking the oxygen out of the yeah, air. Yeah, you couldn't hear or breathe, and, and uh, it scared the shit out of us. And yeah. I was afraid they 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 thanked me later for being the first one to jump. And I go, that wasn't a choice; that was easy. I hope you got extra pay for that. No, no. <laughs> Were the fans upset that the match didn't actually? No, happen? because outside the after the match, she carried on wrestling and stuff. I was throwing water on him, and he and he was getting mad because he wanted to still throw fire at Onita. So I'm throwing water on him and getting, getting him wet, but he still chased Onita around, fought him a little bit into the crowd, and caught him on fire. And wow. then, then we went off our way. Did he ever tell you any stories about uh, his time in the military? Yeah, a little bit. I guess wrestling's nothing compared to what he would have experienced yeah. there. Well, and, and he, he, he was in the, the military twice, as my uncle and, and once as my other uncle. Uh, close to the same name. <laughs> okay. Yeah. What, uh, was he infantry or do you know what trade he uh, was? He was a tank commander, I think. Something like that. All right. Did, did he experience actual uh, war Combat, action? Yeah, or? yeah. Uh, could you tell uh, the short version of the Yuzuka story where I guess your match went into the, the Yuzuka, which is the Japanese mafia? And Yakuza. Yakuza, okay, sorry. <laughs> I have been talking about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, what happened? Oh, the, uh, the one with Tiger G Singh? Yes. Uh, there was this time we're in uh, Hokkaido, which is North High Island of Japan, and uh, there's a lot of mafia there. And they always said, don't go on this side over there, the mafia's over there. But, like, uh, you, 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 do, you run around through all the crowd, and you get to the mafia, you go around them. And so when I was with my uncle, he wouldn't go around them, he'd go right through them, so with Tiger G Singh. It was one day Tiger uh, picked a fight and then, uh, uh, then I had a fight to help, help him to, to get out of it. And I guess Mike often saved me. Yeah, Mike often saved, saved me. The Mafia had me down, like 10 guys were beating the shit out of me. And all of a sudden guys started fl getting flown off me and it was Mike Austin started picking guys off one by one. Now Billy Jack Haynes told me a story that he thinks that Mike Awesome, because of kind of the crowd he was involved with may have actually had a hit done to him rather than kill yeah. himself. Yeah, the, the, he had a hit on him put, one time put. From, a put on him one time we heard. And Tiger Jeet Singh is another legend over in Japan. What was he like? I've heard some people say... Uh, He's okay to me because I was my uncle's nephew, or the Sheik's nephew. Uh, he was okay to me with the other guys. Like uh, He didn't treat them so good. And Horace Hogan was over there, Hulk Hogan's nephew. He was in WCW later. What kind of guy was he? Yeah, he was cool. He was one of my buddies. Horace Hogan. Horace you, Boulder, not Horace Hogan. Horace, Horace Boulder. Horace Boulder, yeah. yeah. He was later Ho Horace Hogan, I guess. I like Boulder WCW. better. Yeah. <laughs> he was a good guy. He was all right. He wasn't as bad as people. He just didn't get much credit because he wasn't as good as... as well, because uh, Hulk Hogan wasn't that good, and he wasn't as good as Hogan, you know. And the fake Razor Ramon was over there. He recently passed away. Uh, any yeah, uh, in? Titan. Yeah, Rick. Yep. Do you think if they hadn't given him that gimmick, he would have had a better run, or was he just a limited wrestler? I don't know. No, he wasn't limited. He was good. Yeah, if they wouldn't have given that, we'd have done something else. I mean, something better. You had some WWE tryout matches in 93. Did they contact you to set those up? Yeah, I think it was 94, but uh, 94. yeah, one or the other. Uh, yeah, they called me and uh, they said Vince wanted to get a look at me. Vince acted like he didn't know who I was, but, and he probably didn't, but he acted like he, he, did, he knew who my uncle was. And uh, so, but anyways, I went in for that and uh, that was that. <laughs> I wrestled Owen Hart in one of the matches. And I guess they wanted to sign you. Uh, I've heard this story before. They wanted to give you the Sultan gimmick that Rikishi yeah. ultimately had. Right. But you turned them down. Yeah. He wanted me to be the. They wanted me to be the Sultan, not for name, but that gimmick with the Iron Sheik as my nephew, or my, as my uncle. <laughs> and so I couldn't do it. It would break my uncle's heart. Even though it was a work, even just to say that would. I wouldn't even say that. Looking at that gimmick, that would have fit you perfectly. 
other than the Iron Sheik. Yeah, part. yeah, yeah. Because uh, he's supposed to have had his tongue ripped out, so that's why he had this thing across his mouth, you know, perfectly good for me because I didn't talk. And then uh, the look, they, you know, they said they had modified my look. At the time, they didn't show me that look, but I can, I see the resemblance, you know. Yeah, and everyone knew that it was Rikishi, so. Right, <laughs> the other Samoan, the third gimmick Samoan. Yeah. <laughs> he was a rapper right before that. <laughs> yeah, he was. And he was a, <laughs> a rapper. <laughs> That's true. That was one of the reasons why it didn't work. Yeah. Uh, the Iron Sheik, did you ever meet him? Oh, yeah. yeah. What did you think of him? I like him, and my uncle liked him too, just that, uh, you know, because no one could ever really seriously compare the two, other than by name, the Iron Sheik and the Sheik, that's close name and gimmick, but the way they both were, you would never confuse one with the other, not, not, not if you really you know, knew better, so, and we liked him, he was alright, he was a, you know, he was a comic. Yeah. Did you have any interaction with any other office workers in WWE other than Vince, that tryout? Uh, just, I think that's it. Um, no Pat Patterson or anything? Oh, yeah, yeah, I, no, a little bit. He wasn't, like, hitting on you and shit. Before. Maybe not me because I didn't look good enough. He was funny. Was there ever any financial offer made to you when they proposed that gimmick to you? No. Yeah, yeah but uh, at the time, I didn't, it didn't sound like much. It does sound like a lot now. I would have took it now. <laughs> <laughs> and you were... At the time, I was so young, I figured if they're offering me that, I'm worth ten times more. And that was around the time that you ECW was starting to gain some steam. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, Vince goes, uh, how can you turn us down for a company that might not even be there tomorrow? <laughs> I go, I don't know how. I just can. And I guess you got into ECW because you contacted uh, Todd Gordon, who was starting yeah. it up. Yeah. Well, my friend Dennis Carluzzo, who ran New Jersey, who was Todd Gordon's rival, said call Todd Gordon. He was a sucker. I could get 500 bucks out of him. So I called him and, and got... And I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I was, uh, I didn't, I was scared to ask him for 500, so I asked him for 300, and he said, yeah, so then took off from there. But it happened to be the same day he hired Paul, but we didn't know each other was going to be there. I had no idea he was going to be there, he didn't know I was going to be there. So it happened to be a, you know, a by chance by, you know, one in a million shots that were together. And what was your initial uh, impressions of Paul when you first met him? Oh, he's brilliant, you know, of course. He, and when you, first, when you first meet him, he tells you everything you want to hear and, and a, t a hundred times more. And, you know, and, and a little bit of it's true, but you expect that you hope all of it's true, but none of it's true. Uh, you know, <laughs> a little bit's true. <laughs> and you feuded with Terry Funk, you beat him for the world title. Uh, any memories of that? Yeah, that was a, a good match. That was the time I wrestled him in the barbed wire match. Yeah. That was probably your most famous match. Was there much plan going into that? I heard you say that, uh, or I heard somebody say that that wasn't actually the proper type of barbed wire. Yeah, the barbed wire is a little bit bigger. Uh, and uh, we went into the match, we didn't talk about much. Uh, and the finish wasn't supposed to go as that. Was that when we got stuck in that ball, he was in, it hurt him too much to roll, roll him on top of me. I wasn't supposed to go over. It was an accident. Uh, uh, but we were on top of him, and they were digging him so much that I was trying to pull him over me. I couldn't do it, not without hurting him, you know. Did you experience any panic when you had your bicep ripped open? Yeah, at first I did, because when I looked at it, there was absolutely no blood. It was just straight down to the bone, and uh, you could just see how my muscle and everything was opened up clean. No blood. And all of a sudden, it started squirting on my vein, and then uh, th that's when I got the tape to try to cut off the circulation. But. But uh, yeah, it scared me because it was all, you didn't see, after a while it got covered in blood, it didn't look so bad. But when it was not covered in blood, it looked terrible. It, looked, it scared the shit out of me. And was there any talk at that point from Terry, we know he's crazy, did he say, let's go no, home? No, he, he was just like, he, like he gave me time to recover, you know, like, yeah, without looking silly. I see. And is it true that he actually kept the match going a little bit oh, yeah. longer than yeah, it was supposed to Yeah, because when I was trying to get my, yeah, I was, when I was sick to my arm, he was still beating me up, but he was keeping the match still alive. <laughs> I kind of ignored him at that minute, at that moment. As long as he wasn't picking me up, I didn't care. <laughs> now, they did have medics backstage for that show, right? Yeah. And I heard that you took 50 stitches without any uh, sedatives or anything. 150, anything. not 50. 150. 150 yeah. Wow. 50 of them fell out the first night because they didn't tie them very good. And they were made with such big uh, stitches that, you know, it looked like a hundred pound, hundred pound, uh, hundred pound test line. It was so thick. Because it was just the EMTs that did the stitches, right? Yeah. Uh, what are they called? Uh, 
They have miscontrol? Yeah. The EMTs. <laughs> <laughs> so they, uh, like, did they I ever... one was a rat. <laughs> I'm serious. Did they suggest maybe you should go to the hospital, get it looked at further? Yeah. yeah. But you just didn't want to take I the time? I didn't want to go. Were you out any time from the ring after that? or No, heck no. No. You uh, ten days later, we did that. I did a three-way match with Terry, Shane, and where I lost. Wow. Uh, so was the barbed wire match your favorite match you had with Funk over the years? Not, not at the time. It is when I look back on it. It's the most thing anybody else wants to talk about. But I had other matches with him that were better where it wasn't a barbed wire match, you know. And you're famous for the tables. I know you didn't do any hardcore for like the first five or seven years of your career. How did you start the, the whole thing with the tables? My first five years, I didn't go for, to the top rope. It was all, not even second rope. There was no corner stuff. It was all, if I did a drop kick, it was from the, the mat up, and that was considered a high spot, you know, or a bad drop, not anything like you can see now. So did it just happen by accident one night? You did something with a table and then it caught on? Yeah, it was by accident. We were in Japan, the first tour, and uh, we, we were in a tag match. And like I said, I was only there so that she could get over. So I did all the jobs. And so she got tired. She didn't understand that. He goes, why are you having me here and you're beating my nephew? And they go, same, because we're beating your nephew, not you. But he didn't get that. So uh, he goes, get back in there. After I got lost, he goes, get back in that ring and get your heat back. I go, what do you want me to do? He goes, I don't know, think of something. And then uh, I looked at the table there, and I go, I, I moonsault the table. He goes, what's that? I go, watch. And I threw it in the ring, and then moonsault the table with nobody on it. Then the next night, I moonsault the table with somebody on it. Okay, I see. And I guess people started stealing your gimmick once you started getting it over, yes. uh, such as Public Enemy. <laughs> they didn't steal it. Polly forced it on them. Because when I wasn't there, he wanted somebody else who was cool and hip that would, did that. Right. Know? Not just like break tables, but, but got over with the fans like I did. And the Chris Benoit incident where you got your neck broken, could you uh, discuss that? Um, that was an accident, and uh, I never said, like held him responsible, but I didn't like him. I didn't like him before that, but I didn't really like him that much after that, but not like we, what I thought he I, I can't say I knew what he was going to do with his family, but, and I dislike him for that, that's for sure. Yeah, what was the reason you disliked him before that? Uh, I, I was with him in Japan, and we were never, never friendly together. He wasn't friendly, you know. I see. If you didn't wrestle him, he didn't even say hello to you, you know. Oh, really? Yeah. And w what was he like in the ring? Other, well, obviously... Well, it was all business, you know. Yeah. He took it too serious. And I heard you say that uh, he actually went to the hospital that night to check on you again. Yeah, he did. Like a sissy. <laughs> <laughs> and the craziest thing was you kept wrestling with a broken neck. Yeah, I, went, I had two weeks off, and then I had to go to Japan for four weeks for FMW and two weeks for uh, New Japan. Wow. Wait, and, I, and for FMW, I wore a neck brace. For New Japan, they said, can you take the neck brace off? I said, my neck is broken. They go, yeah, but can you, can you wrestle with the neck brace off? I go, all right. Since they asked me to, I would do it. You know, they, as long as they understood I had a broken neck, and they didn't give a shit. They didn't care. What was the uh, reason for jumping to New Japan? Just a better payoff? Or? It was better payoff and more respect and, and time to grow, you know. Uh, I didn't double cross Onita. Uh, he, he gave me the blessing eventually. Before I actually jumped. I was threatening to jump the whole time and, and, and uh, for, for a whole tour I was threatening to and then I actually did it, you know. Who was your favorite opponent in New Japan? Um, Liger. Liger, yeah. Yep. Do you think he's going to stay? Liger. What? Do you think he's going to stay retired now that he's had his no. retirement match? No, those Japs, they, they always bring him back anyways. Well, he'll be retired like from regular schedule, yeah. Okay. Not, not from once or twice a year. Are you surprised that I guess Wrestle Kingdom the first night had 10,000 more people than the second night when he wow. retired? I didn't know that. Yeah, they had 30,000 wow. the first or 40,000 the first, 30,000 the second. Oh, I didn't know that. So less people with uh, Liger's retirement and Jericho, strangely enough. Wow. Were you in maybe, ECW maybe when... The, the, maybe the tickets were cheaper. <laughs> yeah. Were, did you have much contact with Jericho in your years? No. Uh, uh, one tour with FMW, he was on it. Not even a tour, a couple of shows, like a Yokohama show. He was on it. Excuse me. And uh, see him every now and then at the airport.
He came, oh no, he came to ECW, I wrestled him once, I forgot. And then uh, he wrestled once and then went to, or he wrestled, I wrestled him once and then he went to WCW. How did you get along with Shane Douglas? Me and Shane are good, we're, we're good, we're cool. And the Sandman? I always got along with, along with him. What about the Sandman? Him too, I always got along with him. Every day, every day you have a disagreement with him, but that don't mean nothing, you know. Yeah, I've heard that story about the fight that he had with Jack Victory. <laughs> yeah. Is that true? Is that true? Could you give us the brief rundown of what happened? Tell me what, what, you tell me what happened. Uh, that he basically showed up drunk, got naked, went to the ring naked. Yeah, with a pouch on. I think he had a pouch. Okay. And he, he brushed his pubic hairs with somebody's brush, a lot, a lot of stuff. And then everybody goes, he should be fired. Well, if it offended you, you should have been there. But yeah, he was too much. I was offended. <laughs> Were you in that match? No, uh-uh. Okay. I was backstage. Were you watching it? Yeah, I was cracking up. And everybody, and everybody back there, every girl back, woman back there goes, he should be fired. And, and, and I'm just laughing. I said, you guys shouldn't be here if that offends you. I said, I don't like it either, but so what? <laughs> you know, it was crazy. Yeah. It went nuts, yeah. And so the actual they fight, uh, did you see the actual fight between Sandman and no, Jack Victory? Uh, that? No, uh, no. I guess Jack Victory was involved in the promotion and just went after him afterwards. Oh, really? Oh, I didn't know that part. Yeah. No, yeah, apparently uh, Jack, that was his town. He helped uh, promote it. So apparently he, according to reports, he attacked the Sandman. Oh, after, okay. But they made up. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that. I think what happened in the ring. And there was a feud with uh, Taz. How did you like working with him? Uh, it, it was all right. It was stiff and you know competitive, but but uh, that is not what it's supposed to be. It ain't supposed to be stiff and competitive. But since it is, that makes it a little more funner. But it don't have to be stiff and competitive to be a good good thing. A good thing. Because he he had an issue with you, I guess, over you taking a New Japan booking over an ECW booking. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. I I had to. Uh, I, t I double booked it. I had uh, April 8th in Japan and April 8th in the States. So I figured I could make both dates. But I wrestled the one in Japan first, then fly home and arrive about 7 p.m. and wrestle the one at 8 o'clock in Philadelphia. But it didn't happen that way. And so when I didn't make it, uh, he cried like a, ba a baby. So <sighs> Paul. Paul was like a woman scorned. He took it personal. He, he couldn't believe it. It's like I didn't show up at dinner one time or something. And why do you think Taz never had the longevity? Like, he never really wrestled much. He had a couple of years. Yeah, yeah, he didn't want to. He didn't want to. He got what he can out of it and became a ring announcer. Now look at him. He's the fucking premier ring announcer in the world now. Did you ever uh, work Dean Malenko? Commentator, not ring announcer. Commentator. Or whatever the fuck you call it. Yeah. I think he's commentating off and on for AEW yeah, now. Yeah, there you go. Did you ever work uh, Juventud Guerrera in New Japan? No, uh-uh. No. no. Have Why? any? Uh, just because I dealt with him <laughs> recently and I didn't have a good interaction with him, so I was wondering if yeah, that... Yeah, I never worked with him. Okay. Did you ever wrestle Eddie Guerrero? Yes. I wrestled in Japan when he was Black Tiger. How was he in the ring? He's great. He's really good. Best. Now, I was talking to you about this earlier off camera. You had a couple of appearances in WCW on TV. You wrestled Alex Wright, and uh, that was on Nitro. And then you wrestled Jerry Lynn uh, at Halloween Havoc with the Sheik managing you. How did those matches come about? Um, uh, Kevin Selden said uh, one day, he goes, how much would it cost to come to our first Monday night? Or how much would it cost to pay me? And he figured that with a dollar bag. And I said, I can't do anything. Uh, I, I'm, I'm in Japan, I can't, or I'm booked, I can't make it. He goes, how much would you do our second Monday night? Or? And I said, you don't have to give me anything, just put me over. He goes, we've got to give you something. I said, okay, 500 bucks. So we wrestle, it worked. They go, okay, you ready to sign a contract? I go, yes, boom. I go, wait, how much am I going to get paid? They go, what you said. I said, what did I say? They go, 500 a match. I said, you're kidding. He goes, no, that's what you wanted. Two matches a month, one pay-per-view, one Monday, and 500 a match. I said, you're kidding. No, I, don't, I want more than that. That was just so you look at me. Then we negotiate. They go, no, you're only getting 500 a match. That's what you wanted. Boom, boom, boom. So I, I, I quit, you know. And uh, that was after, you know, Halloween Havoc and after one or two other Mondays. When I, that's when they, I figured out what, that's what they wanted me to come in for. It was 500 a match. I mean, what a miscommunication. And then they didn't want to negotiate. Not at all. It was, it was pretty bad. 
And the Sheik got hurt managing you at yeah. Halloween Havoc too, I guess. Yeah, when I did a, a flip out of the ring, I hit him on accident and uh, he slipped and broke his good leg. It, it was a, a hip replacement leg anyways, but that was like he had one leg was bad and then that leg and then that one broke. Not yeah. broken too, but broke enough, you know. Did it take a lot to bring him back to WCW in Detroit because he had that problem yeah. before? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, plus, uh, you know... Uh, yeah, because before Kevin Sullivan told me he was the one that convinced Dusty to use the Sheik on, I think it was a Great American Bash yeah, tour yeah. in Detroit, and it had the biggest crowd. But the biggest uh, crowd they had in years, and they didn't yeah. want to pay him. They said, we'll pay you next time, and my uncle doesn't do that next time, stuff. He said I he. Uh, I would have did it just because uh, I, I wanted to work, but he, he he wouldn't do that. Kevin said that the Sheik, uh, he had bet Dusty five hundred dollars that the Sheik would draw. Dusty didn't think he would <laughs> draw. I guess uh, Kevin won that bet. Yeah. So there was another. In the following month, they came back without the Sheik, and it was down to fifty percent of what it was. And how long after those 95 WCW appearances did they finally make you the big offer that unfortunately fell through? Uh, I think it was 2000 or 1999. I think okay. it was 2000. And that before they went out of business. They went out of business one year later. And uh, I didn't sign this contract because I wanted to tell my mother about it first. And uh, but before I could tell her, somebody seen me having a meeting with Kevin and J.J. Dillon and they told Paul e, so Paul e threatened to sue, me, sue, and they backed right off. Before I, and, and before I could tell my mother uh, about the contract, he was, I was already threatened, getting threatened to be sued. It mattered like six hours. I, I, if I would have signed it right away, I would have been a done deal. And for Rob Van Dam, you've known him since he started training. Uh, what were your first memories like of RVD when he first jo joined uh, the Sheik's camp? Other guy, this guy Samson came out and and uh, was introduced to him and introduced to him and all that. You know, he was very gifted. He was very gifted. I heard him say that uh, he broke your jaw in uh, a training camp once trying something, and you were kind of cool with it. <laughs> yeah, because I, I told him to try it, and he wasn't sure with it. I said, "Well, this is how you be sure with it by practicing with me, not with somebody else." You know. Wow. And you wrestled him, of course, in ECW and many times throughout your career. Yeah. Any favorite match of you and him? They were all my favorite. I, I've always had a good... Uh, my last match that I had with him was always my favorite. And the next one is always going to be my favorite. You know, uh, this, uh, for, you know we cheat. I, I trained with him. So, yeah, I've been wrestling for 20, 25 years and we're cheating. But why not cheat when you can, you know? If you ever have a retirement match, would it be against him? Yeah, I kind of wanted to do something like that, but he, he's uh, he's too old. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's re you had a match on Impact with him too recently, didn't you? No, a uh, tag match. Oh, a tag match. Yeah. Okay. And you returned to uh, ECW after a dispute with Paul. Uh, was there much heat with you back then when you uh, first came? No, out? it was cool when I. Said uh, I came, but when I came back to Paul, that was after that thing in Japan, and during that thing, after the thing in Japan, was the WCW thing. Then when that fell through, it was, now it was back with Paul again. Okay. That was all that boom, boom, boom. You know, it was ECW, WCW, ECW, and then WCW. I see. So, were you involved at all when w, uh, WWE had ECW interfere in the Mind Games pay per view? No. Uh -uh. I guess that wouldn't have been your character to, sh to show up. No, nah, I didn't agree with it. Any memories of Scorpio? Yeah, good ones. I had some great, great matches with him. And the WWE did an invasion of Raw. You were probably the most memorable part, jumping off the Raw sign, but yeah. I read that there was actually issues with that. Yeah, but that, that when, I, when I did my part with, WC, with uh, uh, WWF, uh, I wrestled Scorpio, I had a match with him. That was good. Scorpio's great, but uh, yeah, I, they wanted me to ju jump out of the balcony, and uh, I thought that's too ordinary, plus it was like three feet higher than this R, there was an R, R-E-W for Raw, and uh, so I, looked, I, I put a, a ladder behind it and had the W hold it, and I jumped off it, and I kind of, I, you couldn't tell, but I landed in front of these guys, and they all fell down like dominoes, I didn't touch any one of them, I think it was six guys fell over and I didn't touch them, <laughs> it was funny, wow. but you couldn't tell the way the camera angle, it looked like I hit one of them. What was the backstage environment like that day with you guys coming in? 
Uh, it was it was alright. They gave us our own dressing room. You know, there was nobody. We didn't interact with nobody. Only if they like cross someone we knew, they'd come over and talk to us. Oh, I see. Like they acted like those two teams. Like we were two teams. It was funny. We were the visiting team. When uh, you were doing those cross promotional things with WWE, did you suspect that they were secretly paying Paul Heyman at that time? Oh heck, no! You should hear how Paul would be talking about him. How he had never worked for him, and you know he he. He had never worked for him. <laughs> he's how he would never do that, you know. And that's why it's so funny. He's right where he's always wanted to be, but, you know, he lied to us. Now, did WWE pay you for that appearance, or was the money paid through Paul? It was paid through Paul. It was, it was supposed to pay through Paul. I mean, the money that bounced. <laughs> yeah, I was just wondering if, like, they gave, Vince gave you a check after that Raw appearance, for instance, oh, no, or if they no. paid Paul and then no, made they you... paid Paul. We didn't get paid for that. We got a regular, we got paid, you know. Okay, it was part of At your... At that time, I was supposed to be making a weekly salary. Now, I never really got that weekly salary, but I was promised a weekly salary. So I could do 10 shows in a week or three or one, and I got paid the same. That's how I looked at it. But I didn't, also didn't realize it, and now that I wasn't get paid anything, so I didn't get paid anything. Okay, so was Paul just paying you on a nightly basis then? Uh, a weekly, a weekly. A week. So he did actually hold up to that? S sort of, a, a little bit, and then it, it fell into where I'll get you next week, I'll get you next time. Now for the barely legal pay-per-view, you were a big part of that. Uh, was that exciting for you? Yeah, yeah, because uh, you know, it made a decent payoff and uh, it was a good match, you know, good uh, atmosphere. And when ECW joined TNN, did you expect more out of it than what it was? Uh, no, TNN is what killed us because we had to upgrade our TV, uh, and uh, that wasn't us. We were we were the shits. We were supposed to be you know gritty and hardcore, not good TV and good lighting and all that, not good technical stuff, but good wrestling. But we were you know trying to be good lighting and all that stuff, and it didn't look that good. And it looked like a, it looked like a uh, cheap WWE. And it didn't last that TMA long, unfortunately. It looked like a cheap WWE. No, of course it didn't last. And Bill Alfonso, of course, was put with you as your mouthpiece. Uh, how did yep. you like having him with you? I loved him. He was funny and he was, he was good. Did he have any other duties to like help make him earn his pay? Because usually... Yeah, he'd find us weed and pills and stuff when we needed it. Find the fat rats in town. <laughs> <laughs> is it true Raven like the like the bigger rats or he would just yeah he was the chubby chaser I think that's what you call them right yeah and you like fat chicks <laughs> how were the rats at ECW was there uh... Uh, I, I was I, I was already uh, married at that time but oh, okay. what I heard it was uh, pretty good <laughs> and as as far as the uh, we, ever, we all know ECW had a crazy drug scene Everyone was into their own stuff. You were more of a pain medication guy, right? Yeah. I was in a lot of pain, yeah. Yeah. But you would have the alcohol I, people. Yeah, I'd have a little bit of everything, but I, I got the bad reputation of taking this other stuff, which is way harder. And But I only take uh, pain pills, you know. But I had the reputation of taking all kinds of other stuff. Now, who hasn't? But on a regular basis, no. My regular basis was pain pills. And marijuana, but that doesn't count. Yeah. Marijuana, while well, it's now legal across Canada, I think it's legal here in California. Probably. Legal in Vegas, too. Um, but but it's legal to me, so that wasn't considered a drug. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, it did screw you over in uh, WWE. Yeah. But, uh, but not really. Uh, I got fined, and that was, you know, and, and Rob got the shitty end of the stick on that, but yeah. He lost his WWE title because of that, I guess. Yeah. Now, I don't know why they had you know Big Show get caught for exposing himself, and these other guys do a lot worse, and they, and they didn't you know do nothing to them, but they were trying because they said people were looking at us to be fuck ups, and so then Rob fucked up, you know. <laughs> so what's wrong with that? Say it was an angle. <laughs> and reading that story in your book, it seemed like you almost got away with not actually getting arrested for that. It seemed like the cop was almost going to let you off, then he got a whiff of it. Yeah. And then he was, you know, they pulled out all our stuff out on the highway and said he didn't know who we were. Then he puts the belt on himself and spins it. And they said he didn't know who he was. I said, then put that fucking belt away. Because the people were driving by and they could see us, the other wrestlers. And before we got back in the car, everybody already knew. Vince and Johnny Ace already knew. What was... Uh... Johnny Ace goes, what do you want me to tell Vince? I said, don't tell him anything. <laughs> Mum's the word. 
you had to go around and apologize for doing it, I guess. Uh, yeah, but it was a fake. I laughed. Yeah. I, go, ah, I apologize. <laughs> now, when ECW closed, you had already left, right? You had joined XPW. Yeah, but it was really yeah okay. I, I worked for them. There was no like joining. I, if I had an open date, I wrestled for them. If I didn't, I worked for somebody else. You know. Okay. And you did mention in your book, uh, th I found this very interesting, that in the official, I guess, bankruptcy documents of ECW, Paul Heyman alleged that he owed you $2. Uh, I think 2 or $3, two yeah. Or, yeah. And like Shane, he admitted he owed Shane 140 yeah, grand or something. Yeah, thousand, and he admits yeah. he owes me three. So that was just like a little joke. He actually owed you more than that. Yeah. But uh, how was XPW? Um... Uh, it was kind of the shits, you know. It, it was a a, a low-budget ECW, but I was the top dog there, but that don't mean nothing. Because you're top dog in a bunch of bunch of shit, uh, that, that's nothing to be proud of. Right. And Rob Black, I read you were saying the type of porn he was into wasn't even just regular porn. It was like <laughs> really disturbed. Speaking of shit, it was like shit porn. <laughs> yeah, you'd be surprised. And you were saying he... There was rumors, I guess, that he actually put a hit on one of the wrestlers for sleeping with his wife. Yeah, they, had, they tried to cut his dick off, but they cut his thumb off. Yeah. It was even on America's Most Wanted, they were searching for the guys that did it, but it was Rob Black, he put the, put the, put the guys up to it. They said they, he wanted his dick, he wanted to get his dick chopped off and have the, the guy's dick, but they couldn't get it. They stabbed him in that groin area, but they did chop his thumb off, thinking, who's gonna know, right? Well, Rob Black knew, he washed it off and checked it out, he goes, this ain't a dick, you know, it's a, it's a thumb. And the guy ends around with a missing thumb. You know, thank God it's only a thumb, though. But he got he actually tried to cut his dick off, and we're gonna leave until they got a, a body part, which is crazy. But the guy, what was his name again? Uh, um, I don't know. His real name is Billy, but he was called the Messiah. I don't okay. know uh, uh, other than Billy something. But he was fighting back, and they oh, couldn't yeah. actually finish they, the they, He said, actually, they cracked him on the head with a fish, fish tank, and then he seen them uh, stab him in the groin. That woke him back up when they stabbed him in the groin, uh, trying to chop, to get his dick with one chop, but then they had, didn't know they had to saw it. Yeah, <laughs> so fuck. they ended up like popping his thumb off. That's crazy. Yeah. Were you the one that recruited Terry Funk into XPW? Yeah, yep. And I guess the biggest show they had was that LA Sports Arena show here in LA. Yeah, yeah. What was the crowd for that one? I think it was like 3,000, it was pretty uh, good. It was, it was good. And that would be, especially for uh, an arena where WrestleMania was, I think WrestleMania 7. Was it? Yeah, and two. I think they also had two here. Yeah, it was good, I liked it. Now, there was that infamous uh, XPW, ECW fight. You weren't involved with it. No. I got Shane Douglas's version of it, but uh, could you just tell, you know more the XPW side of it, I think. Yeah, but I, I wasn't there. They did it without my knowledge. They, they, they said something to me about it, and I laughed. Like, who's going to do that? Nobody shows up to someone else's show and disrupts it. Nobody does that. If you do that, you just bring heat on yourself and it looks stupid. And they did it, I thought they were joking when they said it. When they did it, I, I wasn't that informed about it until afterwards when I heard that this guy got beat up or is punked around or whatever it was. Yeah. You know, I, I, I was, you know, I had nothing to do with it. And then my ECW yeah. friends thought I did have something to do with it. I go, no, if I knew something had anything to do with it, I would have stopped it. And I guess you said it was actually the ring crew that the ECW guys ended up beating up rather yeah. than the actual wrestling. Yeah, it was the ring crew. And well, um, one guy, um, he was a wrestler, Homeless Jimmy, they beat him up. Okay. But he had uh, almost nothing to do with it. So how did you end up going to TNA? Did they reach out to you? Yeah, they, they uh, Jeff Jarrett and those guys, they called me for their very first show. You know, I worked for them for, since day one, where it was uh, Mid-South Coliseum, I think their first show. And after that, it was Nashville every week for a, a weekly pay-per-view. And I guess uh, Hogan once... That was like 15 years ago. Hogan once stooed you off. He saw you sleeping and he ratted you out to the office on one of your TNA That was Flair, I think. You did say that Flair had an issue with the Sheik, I guess he was yeah, taking he goes, it he, he cut a promo on, on us and then he goes, I never liked your uncle either. I go, you motherfucker. You gotta throw that in there. And I guess you were do he was doing, it was almost a half rib, half reel. He would run away from you whenever you... Yeah. He'd run around like a goose. <laughs> run away like a goose, it was funny. He ran away like that when I was chasing him and I was really mad. I started laughing after about three steps. <laughs> and I guess when he, he finally said he, he didn't like you because of, he didn't like your uncle and that right. was his only explanation of why he had heat with you. 
Were you ever a fan of his before you realized you didn't yeah, like him? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, it, of course, everybody was, you know, if, if you really like wrestling. So it was nothing personal, it was just nothing like... personal. I didn't like him personally. Like they said, don't meet your heroes. Well, they're right. Wow. Yeah. Are you yeah, surprised he's still on WWE TV? Yeah, he's still going and still relevant, you know, still fucking on the young people's tongue. Young people's tongue. <laughs> And you were under the chop. Everybody, woo. <laughs> That's true. Now you were working. People who don't know they're doing it, do it. <laughs> yeah, they don't even know why. Right. Working with uh, CM Punk in TNA, did you expect him to to be the star that he ended up becoming? No, but I expected to be good, of course. But the, the, nearly what he achieved, no. Even when uh, he came to, he did, he was per, first started out in ECW, uh, Vince's version. We rode together. And uh, he just seemed like a, you know, eager to learn and a good ear and a good student. And I, he didn't look like he had the, the potential he had. Were you surprised that uh, he ended up in UFC? No. Well, yeah, but not surprised what happened to him. I felt bad what happened to him. He should have stayed out of it. So I know he wants to be known as that kind of a wrestler, but so why, you know? He's gonna go in there and fight for his life for 60 grand when he can get, get paid, you know, for work. Uh, I think he actually made 500 grand to fight. 500 grand? Okay, I don't blame him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Where do I sign? Yeah, we're, most I'll people take will take a beating for that. Yeah, I thought it was like 60 grand. No, nah, he made uh, 500 grand to fight. Yeah. And you were there for actually his most famous backstage fight with uh, Teddy Hart. Hart. You saved him, I yeah. guess. What well, happened? sort of. He, Teddy Hart went to kick him in the nuts and he kicked me. <laughs> Yeah, the, I broke him up from fighting. I go take it outside, and as I as I was taking it outside, Teddy tried to kick him in the balls, and he slipped and hit me. And and I, and, the, and the story was that Sabu took a low blow and went down. But uh, you know, I got kicked. It didn't stop me. Then I said to him, I said, "Hey man, you just kicked me in the balls." He goes, "Yeah, I know." I said, "What do you mean you know? You're supposed to say you're sorry." But anyway, he didn't mean it. <laughs> And when they went outside, I guess, what happened? Is it true that Ted basically got the better of him? Yeah, it was pretty even. And they both can throw down, but Teddy got a little bit better, sort of. And I guess during a long period of time, you were uh, calling... They both can throw down, don't get me wrong. Yeah. You were trying to call WWE and uh, Jim Ross finally but got throwing back. Throwing down and being an MMA fighter is two different things, you know. Oh, yeah, because street fighting is totally well, it's different. different, yeah. But, uh, and yeah, you're fighting professional fighters that have been doing it for you years. You twist your arm, that's it, you know. Now, uh, with Jim Ross, you said when you were trying to uh, get in WWE initially, around the time ECW was closing, uh, you weren't getting very good feedback from him. Uh, did you get the feeling he didn't like you for some reason? Yeah, he didn't like me, I guess. <laughs> I felt that. <laughs> And it was, uh, I guess, the one night stand pay-per-view that finally made WWE call you up? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, the second one. They wanted to do it before, but they kept had the reputation about I'm hard to work with. Yeah, I'm hard to work with if you fuck me. Who isn't? If you, everything goes my way, I'm easy to work with. They said things would go my way, they didn't. So I wasn't hard to work with. I wasn't easy to work with, uh, you know, being difficult. How were your matches with Samoa Joe? I only wrestled him once and he was great. Yeah, it's good. And for that one night stand show itself, how was your experience overall? Good. I think uh, the, when I wrestled Mysterio, right? Yeah. Yeah, that was great. They Did were high on me then, you know, or they acted like it. Was that the one where the blue meanie thing happened? Yeah. What did you think about all that? Uh, I didn't see it, but afterwards I felt bad for the meanie. New Jack wasn't on that show, was he? <laughs> No. <laughs> yeah, he was, I think. No, he oh, was. No. Okay. I'm not sure. Were you there? I don't think he was on any of the, the One Night Stands, was he? I don't know. I don't think I, he was. I'll have to look it up. Yeah, I wonder. I don't think he was. Were you there that night that New Jack uh, sliced the kid open? No, I wasn't. The mass transit guy, no. Yeah. What did you think of New Jack overall? He, he, he's never been bad to me. You know, I've seen him be bad to other people, and I feel sorry for other people, and I stand up for other people. But if I didn't stand up for him, he'd run right over him. But he never tried that stuff with me, so we were always good, you know. So I didn't want to push it too far, saying, you don't do that stuff to me, and then have him start doing that stuff to me. <laughs> so when, after uh, One Night Stand, I guess WWE decided that they were going to do their own ECW, is that when they contacted you about a real contract? Yeah. 
Yeah. Was yeah. that just for ECW at that time? It was basically a contract. For well, well, it's, it was uh, you know WWE. It wasn't even an ECW contract. It wasn't such thing. Okay. There was no ECW contract. Was there ECW house shows? Yes. They were labeled ECW, but still same payoff, same everything. Okay. Same, How did same, those same bank economy? Did they ever go to the ECW arena? Yeah. 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 Did it draw okay? Yeah. yeah. You know, it, it would draw bigger than we had during ECW days because it can hold more. And you had a match with John Cena during that time. How was he? He was good. He was all right. He was, he was fun to work with. Uh, he, just, he gets a bad reputation, but that's just the way it is when, when you're at the top. It, you can know, always pick you apart for no reason. That would have been an interesting match to have when he got more popular. Uh, if you had still been around, I think that could have drawn on a pay-per-view or something. Sure, could have, would have. Now, I understand you didn't get along too well with Test. No. What was his problem? He was a dick. He just didn't believe in the, someone smaller than him could beat him up without someone actually having to beat him up. You know, you'd actually have to kick his ass to let him know that he was asking to be kicked. And it didn't take much. You just out blow him up and, and he learned his lesson. But still, he, he didn't want to sell for CM Punk one time. And me and Punk go to him, why don't you sell for him? Why won't you sell for him? He goes, because I'm six, seven and you're not. And we, like, we, li we just laughed at him. It's like, watch, uh, see if we sell for you now, you know, watch, you know. And Curry Angle also initially has some problems with you because I guess he told you that he was the risk taker in WWE. <laughs> but he just said he, he was the, 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 the resident crazy guy. And, and I go like, okay, thanks. I'm glad you are, you know. But he, he, we, like he didn't say it like that, but yeah, he, he made it sound like he was the, the top crazy guy, which I didn't never consider myself a crazy guy. No, well, I would never consider him a crazy guy too. <laughs> He's the amateur wrestler gimmick. <laughs> and there was something that happened, I guess, he asked for a, a pill from you or something, a, a medication. Well, he didn't ask. I just said, you're in a lot of pain, yeah. And he goes, yeah. I said, do you want one of these? He goes, yeah. What are they? I go, you know what they are, and give him some. And then uh, he goes, what are the other things? I go, you know what they are, and gave him some. And then the next day he got tested, and he says, he don't know what they are, that I gave them to him. And that wasn't true. And the thing was, they fired him anyways, no matter where he got them from, and they just gave me a warning. But they said, don't you know, give your drugs away, you know, keep them to yourself. And uh, uh, I go, okay, but if, if one of our teammates is hurting, you're supposed to help him, but not supposed to, you're supposed to make him watch him suffer. You know? It sounds like there was huge politics backstage in WWE. Yeah, I wasn't involved in it. That's why I didn't last long. Uh, I figured I'd stay at work, I'd stay at pay, but that ain't how it is. And you work just incredible, an old buddy of yours. How's he in WWE to work with? He's great. Just incredible? Yeah. Yeah, he's, he's awesome. He ain't no fun to hang out with. He's fun to work. <laughs> Why is he no fun to hang out with? <laughs> I don't know. You know? Actually, in your book, I found it interesting. There is a passage where he talks about you and him going on a hike in the woods, and I was just trying to imagine that. Doesn't sound like something you would do. <laughs> <laughs> He's nuts. Like uh, I said, I wouldn't want to hang out with him. And work in the big show. I liked working with him. That's what you said? Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah he, he was all right. Uh, but he's just so big after so many matches, you get your joints get too sore from wrestling. But first, like 10, 15 matches, they were great. And, you know, 20 or 30 matches, they were too much. How were his chops? Terrible. <laughs> Killed me. Stopped my heart every time he hit me. Michael uh, Hayes was an agent back for WWE. Did you have much interaction with him? No, but what little I did, I, I didn't like it. Really? What was it about him? Uh, one day there was something about, he come to me and goes, why don't you do this in the ring? He made it sound like it was his suggestion. Blah, 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 blah. And I go, nah, I'd rather do this. And then Vince walks up and he goes, I told uh, Michael Hayes goes, Sabu just said he's scared. I go, what? I said, I ain't scared. I said it was stupid. And he goes, and then Vince goes, really? That was my idea. I said, well, I'm sorry. I thought it was his idea. I thought it was stupid. But it's your idea. I just don't like it. And then I got hit heat from that. Crazy. He said I was scared. I didn't know what he was talking about. He was a dickhead. And what were your thoughts on Bobby Lashley at that time? He was all right. I, I always had good dealings with him. And uh, was there any dealings with uh, Tommy Dreamer when you were in ECW at oh, yeah. that time? Yeah. yeah, he was one of our better friends, yeah. Do you still work for his uh, House of Hardcore now? No, I, I worked for him one time, but uh, now and then I do. I see him uh, almost every weekend somewhere. 
He's he's a great politician. He seems to be in the office somehow with every company like right so now. It looks like yeah. So yeah, he's got the ultimate uh, pull. Yep. And Johnny Ace, I guess you had some issues with him. He wanted you to wrestle with a hurt neck. Yeah. It wasn't that he wanted me to hurt with a hurt, wrestle with a hurt neck. He wanted me to work anyways. It wasn't because, oh, your neck is hurting, you have to wrestle. It was, it was, I want you to wrestle, I don't care if you're hurt. And you do a great impression of Johnny Ace. Is there any way we could hear that? Harry! <laughs> 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 you worked hurt before. Now, you were given uh, your release by WWE, but you said you would ask for your release because you weren't happy. Is that true? I don't know about ask. Like, I'd go, uh, I don't care if you fire me. That, if that's what you call asking for your release, yeah. yeah. But they don't fire you there. They still have to go through the proper channels of the lawyer and all that stuff. They had made special rules for you to show up, I guess, at 1130 to TV tapings and all kinds of things and you didn't like doing the scripted promos i guess that yeah. was part of it it wasn't me and they, and they said i wouldn't have to do those i thought i wouldn't have to do those you know i really thought i wouldn't have to uh, they go well in order to get over as a as a major heel i mean major baby face you got to be able to talk i said but there's exceptions they go but you're not one of them i said fuck you know you know let's uh make an exception they wouldn't so were you happy when you finally got released then no, uh, only because I could go do something else and I was still young, but no, you know, they, that was really good money. I wasn't, no, I wasn't happy. How old were you in WWE anyways? I was 40. 40, yeah, so yeah, pretty I was much. Still, I was still jamming. And I guess you went to work for uh, Lucha Libre AAA after that for a bit? Well, I've worked with them before, after and during. Okay. Yeah, I've always worked for them. How is that company? Oh, it's all right. Yeah, that's cool. They always draw big houses and they always pay good. Did you hear about the crowd CMLL drew recently, uh -huh. Christmas week? Apparently they outdrew WWE Christmas week. They had 10,000, wow. 14,000, 11,000, 16,000 wow. fans. So they're, they're getting up there. Now, anyone that reads your book, which again, I'll put the link in the description, you talk a lot about the Juggalos. Uh, what's your craziest story for, uh, about working for those guys? <laughs> Uh, well, the first time I met Joe, uh, Violent J, him and this other guy, uh, Rudy Hill, Rude Boy, they came to the arena and they said that they were the, the they were kids of my uncle. And I beat them up because my aunt was there. I didn't want to hear, to hear that. But it was that. And then I found out later it was him, them, and uh, they were just trying to be funny and it wasn't that funny. No. <laughs> And I guess Ric Flair, they didn't take too kindly to Ric Flair when they brought him in for Juggalos. They, they don't take too kindly to anybody at first. They're, they're assholes to everybody, but that's what makes them them, I guess. And they had Iron Sheik booked in a crack pull on a, a match. Crack, crack, crack pipe on a match. Crack pipe. Match. Crack pipe on yeah. a pull match. <laughs> yeah, on a pull match. <laughs> <laughs> Was that during the time that he couldn't walk? Yeah. Yeah, that's funny. You know, you can shuffle. Uh, someone told me to ask you about an incident with this UFC fighter guy, Phil Baroni, at an autograph convention. Yeah. What happened there? That he was just being a dick to you or something? Oh, no, yeah, he was eyeballing Melissa, and uh, it's got to be ignoring me and being a dick. That's okay, ignore me, but don't eyeball my girl. I see. And you worked with AJ Styles when you returned to TNA. Uh, how was he to be in the ring with? He's great. He's really good. Yeah. He's the man. He's the fucking man. How did you get along with Dixie Carter? Fine. She was the, the, the woman. <laughs> she was the bitch. Yeah. And what's your current status with Impact Wrestling? Uh, it's a good. No, it's good. Yeah, it's good. Uh, I, I still work with them now and then, so I don't, I don't know, how, okay, how, am I going to be wrestling there? Every now and then, they just uh, call me when they need me. Now, the Sheik was inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame. Were you surprised they put him in? No, uh, and I only uh, was shooting for it because uh, I wanted my aunt to get the payoff. Other than that, I wasn't doing it for the honor. It's like, there was no honor in that. I knew that, and my uncle wouldn't be honored either, but he'd expect me uh, to get my, my aunt a payoff, so I did. And... Uh, 
Uh, but it was no honor. I don't give a shit about it. If they put me into it, I'll take it for the payoff. Do you think he would have been proud of you uh, with all of your accomplishments if he'd still be around today? Uh, yeah, yes and no. He'd also be saying, see, I told you they're going to steal that table. I told you they're going to steal that. I told you he'd say that. <laughs> What's the worst injury you ever had in a match? Uh, besides my arm, well, my neck. My neck was the worst with the, what I did with Chris. Chris Benoit. Did you ever have an opponent try to shoot on you in the ring? Uh, no. No, not really. I mean, everybody's a little bit. Like Taz and a few other guys, you know, amateur wrestle a little bit. Shooting is really just means amateur wrestling. Uh, you know, hooking is when you want to beat somebody up. You hook the motherfucker. Yeah. And you had an amateur background and you yeah, never so had Yeah, I, I could wrestle back, but I, I didn't want to beat you up. I didn't want to get that far. Right. And what was your biggest regret in wrestling? Not signing that contract when Kevin told me to. Yeah. Kevin's always been a big supporter of yours. What was your uh, favorite interaction with him over the years? Uh, he was there when I very first started. He taught me a lot when I was, you know, super green. My first year in wrestling, uh, I did uh, six or seven, or I did three or four months with him in uh, Ontario, right in the beginning. So he was very influential to me in the beginning. And you wrestled for a long time with a busted hip. Uh, how did you get through that pain? Well, I, I hurt my hip about 10 years ago. Well, now about 13 years ago. And uh, I, I sold it uh, for 10 years, and then finally uh, I had to get the hip uh, replaced, and I did. You know, and that was been like three years. Now it's like a, a new life. I see. What's uh, your current relationship like with RVD? Uh, we're good. We're neighbors. We both live in Las Vegas. And what advice would you give to your younger... He pees on my toilet seat. He pees on your toilet seat. What advice would you give to a younger uh, you now if you could give your, yourself advice when you were just breaking into the business? Pee on his toilet seat. No, um, I don't know. I, I'd said yes in the beginning. When Vince first offered me some money, I would have took it. What are your thoughts on Jeff Hardy? He's cool. He's one of my good friends. And if you could punch one person in the face with a fist wrapped in barbed wire, who would it be? <laughs> uh, nobody. I wouldn't want to hit nobody. How was working with the Eliminators? Everybody. I want to hit everybody. <laughs> the Eliminators are good. Perry was fun. Uh, Coronas was a little bit difficult, but Perry was fun. How was he difficult? Uh, because he didn't keep this straight, he didn't, he was not the same way, uh, he, it was hard to be on the same page with him. He could only be on the same page with him for a few moments and then he, he off wanders and comes back. And I, you know, and I didn't have patience to wait for him to wander and come back. Is it true New Jack attempted to knock a fan off a balcony once in extra? He did minute? knock him off the balcony. Oh, he did? Yeah, he knocked him off and the guy hit, landed at the bottom of the steps. The steps were like a ladder. He hit that and that was what broke his fall. The last three steps broke his fall. What was your overall thoughts on the gangsters? I liked them. Uh, they were the perfect combination, but for some reason, I don't know why, New Jack didn't like Mustafa. He, like, he didn't fight for Mustafa to come back. What did you I think about the uh, Chris candido Sonny relationship? <laughs> I didn't think much about it. <laughs> Were you there for the uh, RVD and Taz pick a hand thing? Yes. Yeah. Did it actually happen the way? Yeah, yeah, it, it happened. Yeah. And Taz just took. But he didn't tell me what was going on. Rob, Rob didn't tell me. He just put the bag down. He had a sour look on his face, and he walked over. To, he he stopped me from passing Taz and went and went in front of me and told Taz to pick a hand. And Taz looked the fuck and like he slapped his hand and then he popped Taz in the mouth. I go, did he just do that? Taz looked at me like, did he just do that? And he goes, pick another hand. He goes, what do you mean? And before he picked another hand, Van Dam popped him with his other hand. And then uh, Taz stood up and goes, Sabu, get your boy. I said, then I did. I said, I didn't know what was going on. I pushed him into another room and said, if you're going to do that, you know, do that here, don't do it in front of the other guys. Now, what was the ECW? And they talked it out. Yeah, obviously they... <laughs> There, I guess there was a, a ECW shirt of you that was misspelled where it said homicidal. Uh, what was that? Was that just an accident? Or was no, that Taz did that on my very first t-shirt. He made it pink and black because he thought pink would, uh, would offend me. And he spelled it homicidal and said homicidal. And he thought that would offend me too. I said, it can't offend me. I, I can't read anyways. It can spell it any way you want. I can't read it. 
Is there any younger family members related to the Sheik that would ever get into wrestling? No, I don't know. I've been, I was poking around, but I don't think so. You know, I, I've even asked a few of my nephews to get in it. And, and well, yeah, yeah, and they never come meet me to train. So the legacy is going to be over when you retire? It looks that way. Now, Rick Rude was in ECW for a while. How did you get along with him? Great. He rode with my, in my motorhome a few months before he died. He, he was a good guy, super good guy. What made you decide to uh, break character? You kept kayfabe for so long. You still do in some ways, but... Gotta get paid. If you don't talk, you don't get paid, right? And believe me, I, I don't like talking. I don't like spilling my guts. So if you want me to spill my guts, you gotta pay me. Memories of working for Mike... I don't entertain myself. <laughs> <laughs> Memories for working for Mike Sparta in uh, Massachusetts. He still owes me some money. That's so funny. He told me if I book Scott Hall, he'd pay me. So I said, if I book somebody else and take the hit if you don't pay him, then you'll pay me? He goes, yeah, I just thought that. Is it funny. <laughs> is it true that uh, Paul Heyman helped get you a better deal for one night stand? Yes and no, yes. He didn't stick his neck out. He didn't, he probably, he probably got me a wet worse deal and didn't tell me. Do you? Uh, he probably got more out of me than I did. Do you speak any other languages? No. A little bit of bullshit. No, Japanese, I guess. What was uh, Hardcore Homecoming like for you back in 2005? Uh, that was all right. That was the match we did right before the first one night stand. That was all right. I liked it. It was a, it was a three way barbed wire match between Shane and, and uh, Terry Funk. So for that wasn't very good that way, but, you know, the, it could be better that way, but. That was still fun. Uh, I got a fan question. What What's your favorite restaurant to eat at? Uh, besides Ribera's in Japan, uh, this place called Little Bay Root in, in Detroit. Do you still have a dream match that you'd like a, to uh, A homemade suicide vest in the back. Oh, really? Yeah. Do you have a dream match that you would still like to have, a match you haven't had yet? Um. Yeah, I want to wrestle Brock. That probably won't happen because he's getting too old now. We both can't be old. Did you ever work on the same show as Andre the Giant? No, no. no. I met him when I was a kid, but I never. When I was like nine years old, I met him. How did he get along with the Sheik? I think good. It's my, I met him at my uncle's house a couple times, and uh, he worked for my uncle a few times. You only work for my uncle if you like him, I guess. Did you like the I Like to Hurt to People movie about the Sheik? Yeah. It was supposed to be a, a different kind of movie, and it ran out of funds or whatever, and that they just chopped it up into the, making it just wrestling. I see. And do you have social media where people could follow you if they want to look you yes. up? Yes. Uh, Excuse me. What is it? <laughs> um, well, I wrote a book, and that's uh, ecwsabu.com, I think. Yeah. And then uh, my Twitter is... Uh, I think it's at Sabu. No, no, at the real Sabu. No, at the real Sabu ECW. Something like that. I can't remember. And then the other one, uh, my Facebook is just Terry Brunk. Did you ever have a match with Vader? Man, Vader, no. I was supposed to have one. I was scheduling one, and he died before we got it together. Is there any move in wrestling that you've ever been afraid to do? Uh, no. Uh, yes and no. I mean, I'm afraid to do that move right where I kill myself. That one sucks. But uh, uh, being afraid of a move, is, I, I turned down moves I thought wasn't fit in the match. And in return, they kind of thought I was scared, which I don't care what you think. I'm thinking professionally. You know, yeah, If I'm scared, I'm going to tell you, I'm scared of this move. I don't want to do it. But if I think it's the wrong move, I'm going to say, I don't want to do it for that. Then if you can persist on it, I'm going to say, okay, I'm fucking scared. I don't want to do this move. You know. Who was your favorite tag team partner? I haven't really been scared of like, any moves, really, you know. My favorite tag team partner was my uncle, the Sheik, and then also Rob. Any favorite match of you and tagging with the Sheik? Uh, yeah, the, a few of them, me and him against uh, uh, um, Tarzan Goto, and, and I mean, me and the Sheik against Tarzan Goto and, and Terry Funk in uh, Kawasaki Stadium one time, that was, that was awesome. How did you come up with the triple? See, when he got old, his, his good matches, his, all of his good matches were with Terry Funk. Like when you wrestled other guys, they didn't really know how to wrestle him because they're still kind of young. But Terry, you know, he was young, but he knew how to wrestle Sheik as an older guy, and, and he wrestled, he enhanced Sheik's wrestling more than anybody. How did you come up with the triple jump moonsault? Right around that time when uh, Sheik said, you know, get your heat back, and, uh, and then each time I'd go to Japan and come back. 
I would invite a new, mo invent a new move, not necessarily a, a flying move, but a, a kind of wrestling move or a wrestling hold or a jump off the chair move. You know, just about every trip I've invented a new one. Is there any wrestler's death that you found particularly hard? Uh, uh, Bruiser Brody was pretty hard because uh, he, I was supposed to go to Puerto Rico with him a few weeks after that. And uh, so before he went to Puerto Rico that time, my plans were to go to Puerto Rico with him in a few weeks, and then he dies on that next trip. And so that, that was pretty uh, shocking. So did you know him? Yeah, he, he, toured in, we, he toured in Michigan before that, but I'd known him for a couple tours in Michigan with my uncle. And uh, like I said, a couple weeks before that, he said I was supposed to go with him into Puerto Rico after that trip. And he went from our trip to, to Puerto Rico, and then he died on that trip. I see. What was your reaction when he died? Oh, it was shocking. My uncle said, of course, because he knows how the island is. But uh, I, I was shocked and still can't, couldn't believe it. Even when I hear about it, I'm still fascinated to hear about it because everybody's story is so different. And, uh, and they didn't even tell these stories when it, really, when it first happened. They couldn't even, no one told any stories, you know? No. Now, if the internet existed, that never would have, oh, he never would have yeah. got away with it. They said the guy, Brody was down, Brody was down, and his keys is right next to Brody. He steps over Brody, dying, picks up his keys, and keeps walking out. Nobody stopped, nobody did nothing. Like, he steps over, picks up his keys, like, and nobody did anything. Wow. And that casual, he stabs him and uh, casually walks out, you know? Do you think the whole office was involved in the cover-up of that? I don't like to think so, but I, I, probably. But uh, the truth, you know, the truth is truth. What's your thoughts been of AEW so far? Uh, I don't think that much about them. I, uh, I watched a little bit of it, but uh, it's cool. I'm glad there's another place. Maybe I can call me. <laughs> would you, you would consider wrestling in AEW then? Yeah, why not? Yeah, yeah. I'd consider wrestling on the moon. You know, that's what I do. I wrestle. It doesn't matter for who. Uh, just, uh, I'm going to go to Pakistan in a few weeks. And they go, you want to come to Pakistan? I say, I want to go wherever they'll pay me. Do you think they'll ever put you in the WWE Hall of Fame? Uh, I don't see how they could say no because of the amount of the influence I, I put. But uh, well, probably, I, I, probably not while I'm alive. Is there still heat with you and Jim Ross or is it over now? It's over. It never was that much heat. What's your opinion on wrestlers like uh, Orange Cassidy and Joey Ryan? Uh, I like Orange Cassidy. Jo Joey Ryan, I like him, but I don't like the gimmick so much. I don't like the touching his dick thing. But the Orange Cassidy, the guy with the hands in his pockets, right? Yeah. W what is that supposed to mean? To say he's not scared? I have no idea. Okay, well, uh, it's okay. F so, uh, I like that better than touching the dick. What's your uh, craziest travel lodge story from ECW? Uh, me, Tommy Rich, and Tracy Smothers got a room, and when we got the room, there was a big red stain with a chalk outline of a dead body of a dead body in the room. And we go, hey, we want to change our room. And so they came in and, and put a throw rug, a throw rug over the, ch the chalk line. Wow. That was great. And how did you end up with your current manager? And we didn't have cameras back then. Nobody had a camera. You had no. Polaroids. You know, you took pictures of rats and that was about it. <laughs> how did you meet your current manager, uh, Super Genie, and how did this whole situation I, I met her in LA 20 years ago, 15 years ago, and then uh, about five years ago, uh, I started hitting on her. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got divorced with my wife about seven years ago, and I started hitting on her about six years ago. What's your side of the story between uh, the altercation with Shane Douglas and Scott Hall and ECW? I don't know what it was about. It, it went back from when they first broke in, I think. I don't know what it was about. I, yeah, I think it was uh, something to do with the click, how he was treated in WWE, and oh. then Scott, just incredible, yeah, brought Scott them. to yeah, a show. Them. Were you at that show? No. Were they at it? Oh, okay, that explains it. Who's better, Super Genie or Fonzie? Super Genie. Did uh, Bill Alfonso ever get offers to come to WWE with you? Um, yes and no. He got offers from me, but they, they, for some reason he had heat, what I don't know about, and he's never told me because he says he don't know, that uh, Vince didn't want to use him. I see. He even had a talk with Vince and said, uh, can I get on this show? This is, you can get on the show, but that's all he wanted from him was one show. Do you think you're crazier than like Evil Knievel was, the stuntman? No, I'm crazier. <laughs> <laughs> What's the craziest thing you ever did in a match? Well, I did this one where I did the, uh, the I only did it once, the top rope moonsault onto a table. 
and it was so far, and I barely made it. I ended up kneeing the guy hit with my knee in his forehead, but that was pretty crazy. Yeah, that I even tried it because I knew I wasn't going to make it. But back then, I, I was so young and tough, it didn't matter if I made it. As long as I flipped and flew, flew and hit the ground and tumbled, that was good enough, even if I missed my mark. What is your opinion of Dusty Rhodes? Uh, I could live without him. Why, you just had bad personal... He never liked me. For some reason, he didn't, he didn't like me. He never put me over whenever I talked to him. He never like gave me that much respect, but that, you know, what can I say? Did uh, Hogan uh, treat you with respect when you met him? Yeah, to my face, yeah. Like he, I'm sure he didn't never... Be. I heard he backed me up in, in a, a booking meeting one time, but now I'm, it's hard to believe it. I said, well, he won't back me up again, I guess. When you had your little WCW run, did the locker room treat you well? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I got treated well. Everywhere I went, everybody puts up a front, you know. But nobody's rude to you. Right. That'll be nice to hear until you turn your back. What's your uh, best advice to an aspiring heel wrestler? Uh, I don't know. Because uh, I would say uh, learn to work on your feet, but that ain't how you're supposed to work now. You know, like, uh, I like working on your feet, but that ain't how the wrestling is now. Everything is choreo. I don't know how to. I don't know. Would you ever have a wrestling school? I know you ran your, your uncle's school. Uh, yeah, yeah. I started to have one a few years ago and I changed my mind. But uh, when I stop wrestling, I'll do it because I don't want to uh, promise something I can't deliver, like practice, uh, train somebody and not give them the time to do it. Anything you want to say to close off this interview? Thanks a lot for uh, talking to us. You gave a great interview. Oh, that's it. Ladies and gentlemen, this bout, one fall, 20 minute time limit. Introducing first, he is guided to ringside by the Taskmaster, the devil himself, the legendary Kevin Sullivan. Coming to us from Levytown, Puerto Rico, weighing 265 pounds, he is the Blood Hunter. The devil himself, Kevin Sullivan, has found himself another monster in the Blood Hunter out of Puerto Rico. And think of the chaos that Sullivan has caused in the four year history of PCW Ultra. Kevin Sullivan, a mastermind behind the success of War Beast early in their careers, and now brings the Blood Hunter from Puerto Rico. A man with a chip on his shoulder. We don't know much about the Blood Hunter. We know he stands, you know, six foot five inches tall. And we hear stories, we hear rumors that he is a vicious murderer. But speaking of vicious killers, my God. And we know a lot about this music and what comes as a result. And the opponent being guided by his super genie. He comes to us from Bombay, India. Weighs 235 pounds. He is the homicidal, suicidal, genocidal, death-defying legend, Sabu. What a reaction for Sabu. We've had our share of hardcore icons here in the Ultratorium. Sandman, Terry Funk, the whole effing show, former ultra champion Rob Van Dam. And how about this? Sabu in the house. There's nothing quite like Sabu. There's no one quite like him. He's homicidal, genocidal. Of course, burst onto the international scene in the early 90s with ECW. But this is the fourth decade now that Sabu has competed as a professional wrestler. Nothing in wrestling lasts forever, but we are honored tonight at the return of Sabu to PCW Ultra. And he looks nimble, man. Quick feet Looks to be Sabu. In, looks to be in phenomenal shape. He's a fixture in the original ECW. Competed in WCW, WWE as well. But certainly at a disadvantage when it comes to size with the Blood Hunter and the and Sullivan has the Blood Hunter out for blood here, immediately attacking, attacking Sabu. And Sabu, for that Devil May Care offense, he needs distance. He doesn't have it right now. Damn. And that's two 
sick chops to the chest of Sabu. Oh my God, Blood Hunter early in this match is dominating. Into the cover, trying to put it away early as the Blood Hunter only accounted two. Yeah, gotta pretty much kill Sabu to stop him. What we've seen throughout his legendary career. But the hard-nosed tactics here continue with the Blood Hunter. Right in front of the devil himself, Kevin Sullivan, looking on from the outside. Sabu's got Super Genie in his corner for some inspiration. Big strike by Sabu, floors the big man, Christian. Yeah, Sabu undersized in this match, double reverse. Oh, wow. Imbalanced, Blood Hunter just flies over that top rope. I think he tried to hook it, stop himself in the corner, but he went flying out to the ring side area. And now, oh man, now the wheels are about to fall off on this one. Well, expect a lot of leniency by referee Rick Knox. There we go. Sabu is the unofficial world record holder when it comes to chair throwing, Christian. I think it's official. Pretty sure Guinness awarded him that back in 2004. <laughs> Super Genie going into that lamp and pulling out chairs. Another big shot there by Sabu. Sabu, former ECW heavyweight champion, ECW television champion, tag team champ. A couple times over, once with my former broadcast partner, Human Suplex Machine, Taz. They faced each other quite a bit as well over the years. Oh, he's got another one. Just violently disregarding that chair into the chest and stomach of the Blood Hunter. And, oh my God, flying forearm from Sabu. Innovative offense, always able to incorporate the twisted metal of a professional wrestling environment into his matches. And Blood Hunter gonna try to answer. Oh, wow. oh my God! What velocity there by Blood Hunter springing off of that chair, beautifully done. Now Sabu, look out here, Blood Hunter with a oh. suicide dive to the outside. Oh my God. Sabu got three chairs from Super Genie as he used up all three of his wishes, Christian. Yeah. Super Genie, super, Todd. Don't be stupid. She's got at least 12 wishes available in her lantern. Sabu has won two tag team titles with Rob Van Dam, former PCW Ultra Champion. And Blood Hunter is all too willing to play Sabu's deadly game here. I don't think he's playing the game of Sabu. I think he's playing the game of the mastermind, Kevin Sullivan, the devil himself. <laughs> Sullivan is a psychological genius. Now we've seen tables utilized. I'm pretty sure that's a door, Christian. Oh, shit! What the f Are you kidding me? The door might be closed on the legendary career of Sabu. Is Kevin all right? He might have got oh. a splinter. <laughs> and we knew this match would be violent, TK. We knew that there would be foreign objects. Don Vitale had a long conversation with Rick Knox before this match and said, we want to see a winner. It's our anniversary show. Rick Knox letting pretty much everything go right now. I am speechless at the carnage here. Sabu with another door. I didn't know that they were uh, rearranging the uh, the furniture, a little renovation here, apparently in the old Tritorium. Kevin Sullivan slid in a chair for the Blood Hunter, but it was intercepted by Sabu, who looks to set it up. And man, how maniacal is Sabu? The mindset of this man is so violent. Uh oh. Uh-oh, look out here. Might be looking for that Arabian face buster here, partner. This is bad, though. There's a door underneath the face of Bloodhunter. This could be awful. There it is! Yes. Oh, my God! What is happening at 2K20? The Ultratorium has turned into an absolute madhouse. 
an insane asylum. Sullivan knows that his blood hunter is in big time jeopardy after that Arabian face buster. The devil now with a chair shot. Blood hunter trying to pick up the pieces into the cover. You gotta be kidding me. He got him. Wow. Ladies and gentlemen, your winner of this bout, the Blood Hunter. And the bloodthirsty fans of PCW Ultra, they're hypocrites. These people are hypocrites. When the violence was pervaded by Sabu, everyone was on their feet cheering. As soon as Kevin Sullivan and the genius of that man was able to get the violence and turn it around, all of a sudden they want to boo. Thank you for watching the Hannibal TV. Please like this video if you enjoyed it and click the subscribe button to not miss any of our latest shoot interviews, match videos, or news updates. Support us on Patreon.com for $1.99 a month to watch our full shoot interviews ad-free and help our channel grow. Follow us on Twitter at The Hannibal TV for instant updates.